<laughs> Hello and welcome to Ralph McWilliams Share and Supplies. And uh, this is Ralph McWilliams himself. Uh, he is one of the main distributors of sheep shearing gear and equipment, hand pieces, anything related to sheep shearing in the US. And as you can see, he has a nice selection of combs and cutters, hand pieces, machines, anything sheep, sheep shearing related he has for uh, the seasoned shears or just people who want to shear one or two head. You know, uh, don't be afraid to give him a call and uh, he'll, uh, he'll be more than happy to answer your questions and have, a good, and have a good talk with you about anything sheep shearing related. Hello and welcome to the famous Seamus Experience, another segment of Meet the Shearer. And uh, this guy, I just worked for him for a few jobs here, so why don't you introduce yourself? All right, Seamus, thank you for having me on your program. Like and subscribe, that way we yep. can build this up and get yep. more views and more likes and comments. But uh, my name's Chase Cantrell. I've been shearing 17 years. Yeah. I've uh, been contracting for 10 years. Uh, my best month, well, my best year, I sheared 16,000 sheep from January till June. And my best month in that year was in the month of April, I sheared 4,500 sheep. So on average, that's about 150 or so a day. And I think we had one, maybe two rain days that month, but it's seven days a week every day. That's a lot of sheep. Yeah, that's a lot of sheep. So when it comes to sheep shearing, you've been doing it for a while. Yeah. Sheared a lot of sheep. And what's a conservative estimate of how many sheep you've sheared in your career so far? In my career, I would say I'm at least at a quarter million, 250,000, yeah. yeah. I don't know if I'll make the million mark, but I'll, I'll try, <laughs> keep going. You don't know if you're that, you're, you're that much of a free cut shearing? No, not that much, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll you, try my best. You got, you, you, you got other interests in life. Yeah, yeah. so on the side, I'll, I drive truck and yeah. you know, yeah. fill in the blanks. Yeah, so um, sounds like you're pretty, you're a well-established shearer. And so how many years did you uh, shear for before you got into contracting? So and I started shearing, I pressed wool first because I didn't, I got out of high school and I did really well in school. I just didn't enjoy it. Yeah. And so I decided I might as well go press wool because I wrecked vehicles and made poor life choices. And so I decided I'd go press wool. And I seen these guys shearing sheep and it was in February and I'm doing the wool and it's zero degrees out and they are just sweating bullets. And I was like, I will never do that. I, I do not want to do that job. And then I got bit by the shearing bug and here I am 17 years later. Yeah. But uh, that I, I just didn't enjoy school. I did well in school, but I didn't like sitting in a classroom all day and I, need, I knew I needed to be outside and have an outside job. So. Mm -hmm. I started pressing wool and some guys quit towards the end of the season. So I got a stand. So in my first year, I got my first hundred. Yeah. And it only took me about a month of shearing, but I had been jumping in on every break. So yeah. a break was 15 minutes to the second on the second hand. Mm -hmm. So if I could get three sheep in a 15 minute break, that's your hundred in a day. And that was my goal. So I'd start well, out and do that's... one sheep on the break. Then I got to two and then two and a half and then the New Zealanders or whoever would take the sheep from me and finish it if they had to start yeah. and I never got to click them it was on whoever's clicker using oh, their really? gear oh, so I never got oh, paid interesting, interesting. so they, so they were it was, shearing it was at your own expense it wasn't my own expense but, but but your main job was wool help it was wool help but they were shearing on average 12 to 1500 sheep a day and I'm making 10 cents a fleece if you could believe that <laughs> compared to nowadays wages but in 2005, well, yeah, that's what year was that? Yeah, in 2005, that would have been 120 bucks a day. Gas was what a dollar 30 or 40 a gallon. Yeah. So I mean, it was good money back then. Yeah, you know, I remember 2005. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So, so uh, uh, what what was the name of the guy that you pressed wool for? It was Bernie Fairchild. It was actually Vernon Fairchild, Vernon. the grandpa, yeah. and he's got the utmost respect. He sheared his last sheep when I think he was 90, 92, I believe. It, it was in his 90s, but he sheared his last sheep to prove he could still do it. Yeah. My buddy was like, do you need help, Bernie? He said, do not touch me and do not touch this sheep. <laughs> and he sheared that sheep to prove he could still yeah. do it. And like, probably the most, the biggest compliment, one of the biggest. Yeah, I was about to say, share the, uh, the 
the biggest compliment you ever got. To yeah. To kind of show off your skill. At yeah. Bowl too. Like the biggest compliment of my life was when Vernon Fairchild has gone through thousands of employees and he said, because it was a lay down press and I had it on lockdown. I was fresh out of high school, you know, really fit. And uh, I just got to where I loved pressing wool. There'd be a mountain of wool and I would just slam it in the press and he sit in his pickup because in that point in time he was probably in his 80s and he he was just sitting back and watching and I, I wanted to impress him and I must have grabbed maybe 150 pounds worth of wool just rolled it up and I had this certain moves you know and I would show anybody to make them the best they can be but yeah. I threw all this wool in the press and like kind of filled it and then and I got that whole arm load in one load into that press and the biggest compliment he wouldn't tell me personally it was his yeah. grandson that had to tell me <laughs> he's like that guy picked up the biggest arm load of wool and pressed it that i've ever seen in my life and that's to this day is one of my biggest compliments in the industry yeah and, then, and then you you were kind of describing that technique yeah, yeah you I kind of roll the fleeces up and get your knee under it but you use your knees as kind of a pivot point and then you kind of rock back and keep grabbing and like tucking it into your belly. And then you kind of turn towards the lay down press isn't the same as the upright, it's a lot lower. So you kind of turn and pivot and roll and roll that wool in. But you have to do it when it's an empty bag because if the bag of wool is half full, you, you can only fill the hopper. But on an empty bag, you can shove it down the back and just keep getting more in. And then. I could press a whole bag of wool in like four or five arm loads. So that means average, it's almost 100 pounds per grab. Yeah, yeah. And that's, uh, what, 10, 10 pieces? No, like 12 to 15? Yeah, 12 to 15, Just probably. Like, <sighs> yeah, yeah. Hmm. Of course, so, the neighbor's got to mow their yard right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so it took you about a month to get your 100 or be able to share 100 or like once you were able once, to like see able. I split a stand so yeah. I would do one day and the other guy would do one day yeah because we were doing half days until he learned how to press wool uh -huh. once he learned how to press wool we did full days to yeah. where we could see who because we were neck and neck yeah and to see who would get their hundreds and it happened that I had because we had all these New Zealand guys so if we got on a bunch of like 700 sheep yeah. They would get eaten up, and yeah. like the learners, they don't get their hunter. But we had a 1,200 bunch that day, so I was fortunate enough to land on that day. It was my day sharing. Yeah. yeah so how how did that first season, you know, progress for you? Okay. So I'll so tell. Like start or uh, the ending. I'll yeah. tell all the people that are wanting to get into it or thinking about it. Like, yeah. it taught me life skills that I would never learn. Yeah. Other than shearing sheep because I you know grew up on a farm and whatnot but my mom she always did my laundry and whatnot so I had to go to laundromats yep. and I lived in the desert yep. and there's no running water so anybody that has running water in a real toilet be thankful and thank God every day that you have that because it's a that's a big deal that you all take for granted yep. but uh, that that was kind of a shock but I got used to the uh the peace and just the comfort of the desert and the yep. birds and the, just the beauty and the it's hard work, but uh, I just learned things in life that you won't learn in a school, yep. you know? Yeah, so more uh, hands-on learning. Yeah, you know, like a vehicle breaks down and you gotta, like for an example, our alternator went out, so we took a generator and put, That's right. yeah, we put jumper <laughs> yeah. cables from the generator in the back of the truck under the hood to power the battery enough to keep the Dodge engine, is the oh. Cummins engine running and we drove like four hours that way and people were probably wondering why we had a generator running in the middle of salt lake while we're driving down the road and i explained to some of my friends is to expand our carbon footprint but we don't do that <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> oh wonderful so at the end of the um your first season um how many sheep did you shear or first of all how long was it pretty much february till june to june and that's when I got a stand because a couple guys couldn't hang till June, yeah. so they quit. Yep. And there was like a bonus run, kind of like, you know, prices or whatever, you know, like yeah. you get to go to California and that's where they had the peelers, you know, on yeah. the grass fields and whatnot. And so I was all in and uh, 
went to California and finished out the season down there. And on the very last day of the shearing season, me and my buddy that we were splitting, pressing wool, yeah. and me and him, when you live in close quarters together for months on end, yeah. not everything goes, you, like, people fight, you know? And yeah, yeah, the little quarrels and the people, very last people trying to get along with each other the very last day i slammed his camper door he said i shut it but he says i slammed it and he wanted to fight and i said do you want to go fist to fist or you want to wrestle it out because he was a wrestler as yeah. well yeah. he said let's wrestle it out then and the whole crew got around in a big circle <laughs> and we ended up stalemating and then having to drive like nine hours back to idaho in separate rigs of course but mm. we still talk to this day like it was these memories are irreplaceable, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you were, what, 18 at the time? Just turned 19. Just turned yeah. 19. Yeah, so finish your first season. So then the next season, were you pressing wool or, or were you just... No, I was shearing full time. And see, where I kind of screwed up is I was so keen. Yeah. I went to Australia yeah. that fall because I'd got my hunters, like, I'm good enough. When I got there, I didn't get a stand because I wasn't quick enough and... Yeah just wasn't efficient enough so i did wool there and i really learned how to throw a fleece and yeah. and skirt the wool because a lot of them were just like man these fleeces are heavy but to me it was just like no they're not you know yeah. and that that was fun that was quite the experience and uh i learned that if you're a smoker like bring your bring tobacco you. everything's more expensive there so be prepared yeah but it was fun it's a culture shock it's definitely a different culture different, yeah different uh shearing world yeah and it, yeah. they don't do it in trailers it's all in sheds, sheds. and yeah interesting so the uh the second season of shearing how how did that go like your progression in shearing it went really well my first season i got my first hundred so i wanted my first 200 my second season and that's all i gunned for 200 so so you you got your 200 this my second, second season. season yeah, yeah. and it was in lambs. I've gotten several 200s in use since, but uh, what what pushed me over the limit to get me my 200 is this old guy, really negative. He'd cuss and yell all day and kind of beat the sheep, and that's another yeah. problem. Like, I could see the industry's improved with the quality of shears that yeah. we have now because yeah. the generation gap was huge, mm. and now we got young guys coming up and everybody's more they understand animal husbandry better whereas the old guys were just kind of crazy and this guy would cuss me all day and he told me better luck next year you know and yeah. i was just sitting at like 174 yeah so i need 26 and there was only like maybe an hour of shearing left and i was with some guns that were just old school you know yeah. running the rakes and seven tooth combs and uh I just went beast mode and i put at least one or two sheep around every single one of those guys and just oh, yeah didn't see or think anything other than getting my 200 and i ended up with 201 and just to prove him wrong like i just i couldn't handle it you know but uh such a good feeling that's what sharing like when there's nothing left in the gas tank at the end of the day like yeah. and you feel like you could not shear one more sheep but the sense of accomplishment that you gain it, it just feels so great yeah yeah i got i got my first 200 this season and uh um not there there was nobody you know being a jerk being, about be, it. being a jerk <laughs> to me about it but uh we were shearing these sheep and um they were pretty tough shearing um they were um, a little juiced up on electricity yeah and so they didn't sit very well but i remember sharing there the first day i got 164 and i was like you know what? yeah i can get 200 a couple more an hour yeah yeah, yeah. so because I, I can have this weird thing when i go to a job for multiple days you know the first day is just really feeling out the sheep getting 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 to know the herd and second day is when i really gun it and i remember uh thinking yeah 200 tomorrow and uh you know, i was i was uh so the, the crew i worked on they normally do a two hour run and then an hour 45 and uh so at the end of the day you know it's a seven half hour day and i was like to uh the boss man isaiah i was like isaiah man if i'm close to 200 we gotta we gotta do a full eight hours yeah i need to get that 200 he's like whoa we'll see we'll see 
And so anyways, I'm pumping out these sheep as fast as I can, you know, pretty good quality too, might, might I say. And um, we're getting towards the, so on the last run, I was, on a, I was at 139, I think. And we were at like six, uh, no, 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 uh, like five and a half hours of shearing. I'm like, Isaiah, we have to do a full eight hours. He's like, uh, okay, okay. So we finished out the lamb or the pregnant ewes and, um, and then the ewe lambs came in and I was at 140, I don't know. Anyways, all I know is I did 61 ewe lambs and by no yearlings excuse me yearlings and um and the crew was kind enough all the top guns to leave a couple sheep to like not share for about 15 minutes to make sure i got my 200 and once once they knew i got it they all start sharing again but man it was a pretty satisfying day it's yeah like, yes i joined the club yeah joined the club but yeah, I, 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 but I did, I did have to work hard. Like, yeah. like George, George, George Kerr, the guy that kind of brought me on as somebody with zero experience, which not a lot of people would do. Yeah. Uh, he asked me, Seamus, like, what's your main problem or like, what's your main concern when sharing, shit like sharing to you? Like, I, I can't keep enough liquids in me. I sweat so much. He's like, come with me and gave me a couple Gatorades. He's like, drink these. I was like, all right. So George was all, so, so supportive about my adventure into the yeah. 200 club but anyway and that was kind of my problem too is because yeah. the cooley brothers they're all older and yeah. they, they are legends yeah most of them are still alive you know yeah. all the sons yeah. benny cooley's passed and i i know a lot of the old legends and that's kind of hard to uh like when you do a shearer's memoir but the cooley brothers they would only do like six hours we do a two-hour run yeah and terry cooley was phenomenal he would grind everybody on the everybody's gear he would grind in the morning still come in the shearing trailer and smoke everybody grinding their tools but we'd only do about six hours we do a two hour run and then 15 minute break and then go till lunch so about an hour 30 hour 45 yeah. and then they always wanted an hour 15 lunch because they like to get a little nappy poo in you know nappy poo. <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know so you get your nap in at lunch after you eat you know and then yeah. you attack the rest of the day and Usually by 4 5 o'clock, it's like we're done. There's no lights in the shearing trailer. Okay. Like you do not shear after dark. Like you get them the next day, or yeah. it rained out, snowed out, you're done. Like if they were just a hair damp, no shearing. Like they were pretty <laughs> serious about their time off, but they were really serious when it came down to peeling sh sheep yeah. out. They were really good. Hmm. Funny. So. So how, how how long did you work for Fairchild before you? Because I, I remember you mentioning how you wanted to explore different. Uh, yeah, so routes. I pretty much, people always wanted me back the next year, or the next year. But I would tell them, I want to shear for every contractor to see who's the best, where I have the most sheep, and who I can shear the most yeah. sheep for. Yeah. And so I went Fairchild, Cooley Brother, Ed Wild, helped Cliff Hoops a little on the side, went to Oregon and sheared with Mike Cowdery, and that was fun, new yeah. experience and sheared back with Fairchild, and that's when I did the 16,000 in six months. So, so Fairchild still had the most sheep? Yeah, yeah. But it was hard because they had all Uruguayans, and I was the only English speaker on the crew. Oh, okay. And so it was hard to have the same camaraderie, you yeah. know? Yeah. And just they lived a different lifestyle. We're all living the same lifestyle, yeah. living in campers, but... Yeah, just different just, culture. Yeah, yeah, different culture, and it was just kind of hard because I was just by myself and it would get depressing so i just shear my way out of it you know <laughs> but, uh, can't be depressed if i'm bent over yeah yeah shit. yeah pile of money at the end of the season and uh, no it was good and then uh i just seen some contractors that were i'm not gonna name their names but just yeah. subpar yeah and it's like if they could screw it up i can be a contractor and do better <laughs> than that you know so yeah i don't know i've been contracting 10 years and it's been fun and I've, yeah. I've enjoyed it. It's just stressful and four kids and being on the road yep. and dogs and, yeah, you know, yeah. it gets yeah. to be a little I want to talk about your transition into contracting. So I remember you saying that, you know, that there was just a need for it. Like, yeah. Like, like a lot of ranchers would have more sheep or ranches would have sheep. 
if there was more shearers. They had to sell out. Yeah. A lot of them would have sold out if I wouldn't have picked up the reins. Yeah. Some of the old people that have been in it generationally, yeah. you know, they have like 5,000 sheep. They'll find a contractor because they've got the numbers. The but numbers. you get the 500 head jobs and yeah. some of the 1,000 head jobs, which sounds like a lot to some people. But when you're out west, you know, that's just junior burger stuff. Junior burger, yeah. 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 The, the first ranch I saw with sheep had, had like 1,500. I'm like, oh, wow, this is a big ranch. Like, now we're actually on the smaller end of things. Yeah, a big ranch is like yeah. 3,000, yeah. you know. A really big one's like seven, you know. Yeah. But no, it, it was just, it was time, and the gap needed filled, and I didn't want, I just didn't want them to sell out, and I, I really made a lot of friendships because it wasn't, some people, I they're just clientele, but most of them are friends yeah. as well, you know. Yeah, one thing I noticed about is that when the old guys, if they're still on the share and run, it's, it's, it's more like a social hour. Yeah. Because, you know, they've been sharing their sheep for years, you know meet up, catch up, eat some good food, and yeah. and move on to the next job. So the demand was there, and you're like, well, if these people can do it, I can yeah. do it too. And I'll give a shout out to Wade Copperin because we had a five-man crew, and we did a 1,000 almost every day on a daily yeah. basis, and my wife was pressing wool, so I got to give a shout out to Amanda. Yeah. But uh, I, he taught me a lot, and he was uh, really good to work for, you know? Yeah. and. You're not supposed to be friends with your employees, so they say, but that's maybe part of the reason I've had a hard time contracting is because yeah. I feel like we're all a family and they call it a shearing crew for a reason or a shearing gang. Yeah. Or, you know, we're just a family and we all cook or we all we all work together to, yeah. to accomplish the mission, you yeah. know? And win at the end of the day. Yeah, it's a solo sport, but yet again, it's a team sport, you know? Yeah. yeah. Kind of like wrestling. Yeah, exactly. Individual performances, but it's a team. Yeah, a team at the end of the day. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And uh, so you made the transition into uh, contracting. And uh, I do know that you brought in foreigners, right? Yeah. Every, yeah. Like, did you always bring in foreigners? I, I started out with all Americans yeah. for the first couple of years, but the demand was so high. And the Cooley brothers sold out yeah. and went out. And they said there was just tens of thousands of more sheep. And, and you just needed I pretty much had to get the foreign. The, I couldn't find the domestic you know yeah. and now because of you and things like this we are going to see a surge in domestic shears which is great and that's why i'm glad you're doing this but uh you know this is only 10 years ago so say nine years ago i started yeah. getting the new zealanders australians yeah. i've had scottish guys and yeah. just a lot of really fun people and i have no regrets yeah but really the domestic supply is sort of the backbone and then it's good to have the foreigners for back yeah. up and to teach like we we can all learn and yeah. you know yeah. they don't mind if americans go yeah. cheer over there yeah um you know talking to george kerr who's a very very seasoned shearer you know yeah. he said when he first started shearing for daily agard um that the uh foreigners wouldn't really show him anything because uh they were kind of like oh these are my trade secrets or whatever but but uh um, so did you ever have that I struggled sort of thing? with that. Yeah. yeah, the New Zealanders yeah. you could watch them, but they won't like But explain. they won't teach you anything and like they won't show you certain blows, you know, and or I don't like knickknacks or Yeah, little, yeah, like, like the little, little tricks, little you know. Quirks that yeah. make it more smooth. And that's why I just teach everybody yeah. everything I know if they ask and they want to learn, I'll teach them. If you don't ask and you don't want to learn, yeah. it, it just feels like a waste of time because I've had an issue with that like I've trained multiple young men to shear sheep and they just get proficient. You know, they get their hundred yeah. and they either go find another job or, and so I've wasted so much time. So we need sort of a better apprenticeship type program, kind of like yeah. what George has. Yeah. Yeah. And then, but, um, but we have one thing that's a little more prevalent today and that's cameras. Yeah. And, and I think that's how I was able to progress as well as I did. Yeah. Because I, I would ask, you know, a good cheer, hey, can I just put this camera on you? And they'd be like, yeah, go ahead. And so then I'd get the footage, and then I'd just watch and study. Yeah, after yeah. work, doing yeah. the homework. Yeah, like, uh, I'm not exaggerating when I say that. I probably put in, I want to say 200 hours of watching shearing videos a season. Like, watching myself shear and watching other people shear. And then, like, watching people shear around me if I'm doing a group shot. 
and you know like uh, people might say oh shams you're just talented or whatever whatever but you know i do put in the hours yeah to, to get better and 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 i will swallow my pride <laughs> and let people beat me if i want to work on something that bad well and that's what i figure if if i teach you everything i know and you can beat me, then you're a better shearer than me, obviously. But it, I think it's sort of a fool's errand to, this is what a lot of the farm flocks do. Yeah. They'll watch five YouTube videos and then buy a pair of the Premier Clippers <laughs> that get yeah. hotter than hellfire. And then they then they call me, can you show us how to shear sheep? But Whereas you can watch videos and learn from yeah. them after you know the basics. Sure. You can't just watch YouTube and think you can shear sheep. Yeah, you need the feel. Yeah, yeah, and like you can watch their positioning and their footwork and their knees and their left hand and know what's going on. Whereas if you've never sheared a sheep and you're watching YouTube and going to go shear your own sheep, the only thing you're doing is watching that shearer's right hand yep. and learning nothing because that will come after you get your footwork. You yeah, know? yeah. It's, it's, it's like uh, somebody learning how to wrestle, right? Just, just watching YouTube videos on, well, Pretty, a pretty common thing in the jiu-jitsu world is some guy comes in and he's like, yeah, I'm a black belt in jiu-jitsu. You're like, oh, under... So with jiu-jitsu, it's, it's about who, whoever you, you train under. And sometimes they'll say, like, this online, like, program, you know, they... But they, you can't feel the weight displacement, Yeah, you know? yeah. It's like, oh, really? So um, you learn by watching... You got your black belt watching YouTube videos. Okay, well... I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah, well, it is a thing. And it's like, all right, show me what you got. And the best way to see if somebody's faking it is just, like, grab their wrist and see what they do. And, like, the, like usually the moment you grab somebody in the first five seconds, you can have a good feel of, like, if they're legit or not. Yeah. So it seems like the same things with shearing. Yeah. Just watch videos and just somebody says, oh, I can shear. And you're like, okay, here's a sheep. I've had a couple disaster deals. Like, this guy sheared alpacas. And I picked him up on my way down through Utah. And yeah. He wanted to shear in between me and another guy, and I realized he had never struck a blow on a sheep, and I'm sure he tied up the alpacas, so he yeah. knew how to set the comb flat. But and, and hold the handpiece. We had to put him at the other end of the trailer. It was just a danger hazard, and it it was just scary, and he didn't work out. His dad had to come pick him up and oh. get him out of there. and He just was kind of a different, different, cat. different character, yeah. yeah. So, anyway, so... After a few years, you started just bringing in foreigners. Yeah. And, and uh, but I would still keep as many Americans as possible. Yeah. As well as training them, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, well, you mentioned you trained many young guys, and once yeah. they get proficient, they just go on to something else. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, let's talk about your uh, transition right now, like. Uh, like you mentioned, you want to be home a little more often. Yeah, because my dad, he's uh, retiring from farming, and yeah. if he sells the farm, there, pretty much when you sell a farm, you never get to buy it back. So if your parents have a farm, don't ever let them sell it. Just try and take it over or lease it. Yeah. But uh, that, and it was just real scary as far as, because my wife would tow the camper yeah. with our three kids yeah. and three dogs. And I'm towing the shearing trailer, yeah. and you hit a snowy pass, and it's just too much stress. It was scary, yeah. you know. And we would yeah. try and travel in good conditions, but you can't always predict the conditions 100%. Yeah. And yeah, I've so jackknifed yeah. a shearing, shearing trailer. trailer, yeah, and it was really scary. Like, yeah, and that's that's probably the one thing that it's probably the most nerve wracking is like just the danger involved, but you could eliminate a lot of that by not traveling too much at night yeah and yeah. check your weather forecast and yeah. follow the snow plow yeah you know? when i uh when i worked with cliff hoops in the fall he's like all right we're not going anywhere today the wind's too high i was like oh yeah i guess you have to think about that when you when you're driving a huge sharing trailer you could probably catch a good wind we never worried too much about the wind it was more the snow yeah. sleet black ice and just depends on the day and the yeah yeah and we we used to drive till two in the morning you know we'd be hardcore to get to the next job Ooh, so you know and hardcore. it just doesn't pay off it doesn't yeah. pay because you really have to recover from your lack of sleep and everybody's groggy and you don't yeah. make it up in numbers i don't think yeah um as as i travel more um 
I've, I've, I've become more like, I don't really want to drive at night. I'll just stay here and leave early in the morning or something like yeah. that. And, uh, and uh, I usually stop every two, two to three hours, you know, walk around, yeah, get take a snack. A break. Yeah. yeah. So um, if it's okay with you, why don't you share uh, the, your, your relation with Quentin? Or like like uh, what? Yeah, you're doing so, Quentin. Route. I knew I couldn't do this with four kids now, because I yeah. said, "Oh yeah, three kids in a camper." Well, now we have four, and we have six dogs at home, but we only take three with us. But I've got some sheep at home, turkeys, ducks, chickens, and it's just a pain for somebody else to take care of our animals while we're on the road for four months, yeah. and. Uh, like I said about my dad's farm, taking his farm over. So I met Quentin, and I realized how keen and hardcore he was about, like, he was always on time. Yep. He loves shearing sheep, and that's part of it, the passion. You could sense the passion. I know you've got it. Certain people have it. Certain people don't. Some people, they will never beat me simply because they don't have the heart to beat me. But I know Quentin and Seamus might beat me. They haven't yet, but when they do, I'm going to make them earn it. But uh, that's that's why I picked Quentin is because he's just a ramrodder, hard charger, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, his 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 story is a little little interesting too. Just bought his first shearing route when he was 21, way over his head. All right, we had a little intermission there because uh, the sun was beating down on the camera a little a little too much. We had to give it some time to cool off. But um, so we were talking about uh, oh yeah, your transition of getting out of contracting. Yeah, so I, yeah. I want to help my dad farm, but I also have other side businesses that I want to start processing wool, mm -hmm. as well as build sheep. One shear, he was an instructor. I don't know if it was Dave Rathke or Doug Rathke, sorry. Yeah, yeah, but Doug. one of, it was somebody told me a good shear. No, Kurt, he, he's always the announcer at like the Black Hills. Oh, yeah. He said a good yeah. shear will always like in his area will grow the sheep numbers. And so I would like to get some nice peelers. Yep. And in that way we could kind of do an apprenticeship because there's a lot of widows or people that just have a lot of weeds in the corners of their fields or they just, they'll farm and then it just, they let it set all fall. Yeah. And we could actually be having production off of that. But yeah. If we get good sheep and we get an apprenticeship, we can build the shearing industry as well as the sheep industry and the wool and sort of, uh, and everybody likes, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people like to eat lamb. And when they say fresh New Zealand lamb and you're in Costco, guess what? They didn't ship it over here on a ship alive. So I don't know how they can claim it's fresh, but. Uh, <laughs> So I would like to tackle some of that. Yeah. On yeah. you know, I'm I'm still gonna work every day at building the industry and I'll still shear sheep locally and yeah. you know, I'll yeah. help yeah, I'll little, help Quentin out. If he has a breakdown, I will drive out and yeah, or, uh, help him or whatever, you know. Or just um, farm flocks and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. In farm flocks in well somebody told me that, you know, if you want to know who has good sheep, find the guy who used to shear sheep. Because he's because he's gonna take care of his wool, because he knows like if you take care of the wool on the sheep, the yields the yields gonna be better. Yeah. And like the health of the sheep is gonna be better, because they know uh, that. Uh, well, they just know a good healthy sheep produces a good fleece. Yeah. And and it's easier on the shear. Well, and also that. I think where everybody's gotten way off track is because the wool has sort of gotten to be just a byproduct of the lamb yeah not in every case but yeah. in a lot of cases to where they're more about the lambs than anything but i like a nice warm wool sweater and wool is not itchy by the way if you have nice fine wool mm -hmm. but uh and they've bred the sheep so big to where they haven't bred us bigger yeah us and humans. they think that they're gonna have bigger lambs but the producers if you're watching yeah. don't like the, you have to feed that ewe year round. Yeah. You're only feeding that lamb for what six, seven months. Yeah. You have to feed that ewe year round. If you're feeding hay, have you seen the price of hay? So I would suggest uh, maybe a medium-sized sheep. You're more likely because there's a give and take. You have yeah. a big sheep, it's not going to have as fine a wool. If you have too fine a wool, you're 
more likely to have singles yeah as far as lambs go so yeah. you want twins and you want just a medium good sheep yeah yeah and that's what i would like to promote and you know? then and if 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 the sheep get too big you know bigger than humans who's 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 gonna shear them right yeah i it just it yeah. doesn't make sense to me because they're they're supposed to be more productive as far as like in a different way they're yeah. not as hard on the ground like cows and horses you yeah. drive by pastures and they're just not decimated dirt. just dirt dirt and mud dirt and mud and just yeah and you see a sheep pasture and it's just a nice green hillside because they just they're light-footed and yeah. don't do the damage to the environment they're also you know, it works for sort of a fire danger. You know, the big flocks that go through the forests, and they need yeah. to graze more. You know, yeah. they need to graze more sheep. Yeah. So, let's use that to lead into another question: Is uh, you know, you've been in the industry shearing, and um, and then you've seen the producers produce and stuff like that. What are um, some things here in America that uh, that American producers and shearers could work on? Or what are some improvements that you'd like okay. to see? Yeah. Okay, that's a good question. Yeah. I, I could probably go on this one for a while, <laughs> but I'll do the main points. First yeah. of all, metal ear tags got to go. If you're a sheep producer, metal ear tags, uh-uh. No. They're not good. It's dangerous. It's a danger to us. It's not good. And it's not just about us, but you don't want to be getting sued because somebody gets a lockup. Cliff Hoops yeah. had a guy lock up into his arm cut the tendons he almost bled out had to be life lighted he got life i think a three-quarter million dollar settlement out of that and i don't know if that goes to the rancher or if that goes to workman's comp but it's a yeah. bad deal yeah but that and oh i lost my train of thought i was leading into some other big stuff yeah well the i'll just expand on my own thoughts about lockups okay. uh they suck yeah. So hitting the middle, you're taking. I'm um, so I tell people that I started shearing at, at the right time because the equipment's safer. Yeah. And, and like uh, there's like computers inside the motors now. When they sense a lockup, they shoot the they shoot they shoot the arm out. Yeah. And as a beginner, um, that was very very helpful because uh, um, I've used different machines where I, I had a lockup and it didn't shoot out, and it was like drop the handpiece, you go for the machine, or you drop the handpiece and you just run. Because yep. it's pretty dangerous. And yeah, I've had to run. I've had lockups. It was very scary. Yeah. But I remembered what I was just going to talk about is yeah. that the American sheep producers, they need to be very fortunate that they are in America because in Australia and New Zealand, they have to supply the shed. Yep. They have to supply the wool press. They have to supply oh, all the, the shearing press. motors. Wow. And all the shearer does is show up with a handpiece and the contractor charges them between and this is before inflation. Yeah. I, last I checked, this was a couple years ago. The contract rate is about seven bucks and it's probably up to eight or nine now yeah. for contract rate and they pay the shearers like four bucks. Yeah. So me as a contractor, I have to foot the fuel bill. Yeah. I have to tow the facility or office yeah. job to job as well as the wool press and maintain all the equipment and you know, I lost two transfer cases this year. That's like four thousand dollars. It's going to cost me, and I'll do it myself. But that's four thousand dollars with the when you turn in the old one with the yeah. core charge. I still have four thousand dollars just in, and that's just the transfer cases. That's not counting the tires and the yeah, yeah. You know, so these guys in New Zealand, Australia, they just show up. Yeah. The contractor supplies vans, and everybody jumps in a van, drives to work. Yeah. shears that shed and goes home every night whereas yeah. we live in the desert yeah which we do it different in america i'm not saying we have to do it like them but well, i'm just thinking, I, was, I was i was also going to add that you whenever you bring in shears you do provide housing housing for them and transportation and, and since they don't own it yeah a lot of the times when they bring it back it needs a lot of work done on it yeah so I, I think that's kind of a frustrating part it's yeah. like and i i try and help everybody out as best i can and give them the rundown on like how to take care of things make sure you check the oil yep. between each job yeah. before you leave or a long drive and yeah. watch your because i had to put an engine in a motor home because they weren't watching the temperature and they i paid like six thousand dollars for an rv and they blew the engine i had to pay for a new engine they said they were going to buy that motor home from us and then they didn't yeah. 
So now I'm out, and it was like four thousand dollars for an engine, so I'm out like ten grand. Yeah. But I guess I have a motorhome with a new engine. Yeah, yeah. Lots so, of family vacations in it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, so between what are some things that they do in Australia, New Zealand that you would like to see Im implemented here in America? Well, I do like. I like how everybody's like pretty much on time, but they say the drugs are a big factor in over there, yeah. you know? And drugs are a big factor here as well, so don't do drugs, they don't do you any good. No. But uh, just everybody's more on time and more professional about it, and a lot of the guys that I've trained, they just treat it like a side thing. Yeah. And so if I can make a suggestion, if you're wanting to get into it, make a five to 10 year plan, preferably 10, because if you shear for one or two years and you just start getting good and then you do another job, you went through all that pain and suffering without the the benefit of how great it really can be, If yeah. like once you get good. Yeah, I have a 10 year plan. Yeah. Yeah, so and, I figured I'd give it my all for 10 years and then reevaluate. No, and I admire yeah, that because yeah. like at least you know and you're going into it attacking and I, yeah. I would suggest that plan to anybody. Like, yeah. Because you really get good. You you might get kicked in the face in the groin a lot when you're learning, yeah. but it happens a lot less the the more years you go. And like I shared with a guy who's like 60 some years old, John Balderson, shout out to him. Yeah. He passed away not too long ago, but a funny story is we were cheering along and my wife had pink eye. And I was like, I told her, quit winking at me, you know? <laughs> And so she was mad. Well, I got kicked so hard in the face by a sheep. I had to check to make sure I saw an eyeball in my head. Like I, I did. I had to check to make sure my eye was still in there. It hurt so bad. So I have a black eye. It's all swelled up. A couple hours later, John, he's the 60-year-old guy. He gets kicked straight in the eyeball, too. So all <laughs> three of us on the crew had black eyes. And I don't know. There's just funny stories that could go on forever when it comes to cheering. Yeah. I could tell you a story about a Canadian guy that had, I told him, you might as well just pack your stuff and find a new job, because he, we were tagging sheep, and he was just having a heck of a day. He got kicked in the lip so hard it split, and I had to hold it together and super glue it. Yeah. But the super glue stuck to my fingers, so I had to get my fingers off, so it like tore yeah. it open more, so I had to like hold further back, have somebody else glue it, and then, so that happened, and then we we're sharing along, and his toolbox full of tools falls off the shelf, and tools go everywhere. We were crutching. Yeah. And then a couple minutes after he gets all his tools picked up, he goes to grab a sheep, and it runs forward. And he steps into the chute to kind of grab it, yeah. and he steps off the kickdown door, and it flies up 100 miles an hour and gets him in the groin. <laughs> and it was one of them days, it's like, man, you're probably questioning why you chose this line of work. Yeah. But <laughs> maybe, maybe you should just sit out for a few hours yeah yeah come back tomorrow yeah. just find find a woo sauce moment uh, no matter how perfect the in industry we can make it there's always going to be kinks that we can work out so yeah i would say the main thing is for the crew always try to hire positive people and be positive yourself always mm -hmm. be positive because one negative person just sort of spreads negativity like cancer, and, but. And like kind of drags the whole crew down too, right? It does, it does. Yeah. Cause I've worked with people that were sheep beaters and they would just cuss and scream all day. And that, yeah. I'm really excited about the shears I see coming up because that's gone. Mm -hmm. Like this is the most positive crew I've ever had. Really? Was this year. Really? And there was no negativity. I had a guy last year, it's five o'clock. He wouldn't want to shear till because I cut the sheep off one time. Yeah. And there was quite a few sheep out the back. And uh, he's like, I thought we were knocking off at five and it was like 4.55. Yeah. And I just hammered down and went so hard. And we, I threw my last sheep out and checked the clock, it was 5.01. Mm -hmm. And so instead of going to him, because I didn't want to cause conflict, I yeah. went to another guy, I was like, how's that, Nathan? We ended at 5.01, <laughs> you know? Just to kind of rub it in like, yeah. You know, I just, I, I I have a hard time with negativity because it's a hard job and I'm not gonna try and church it up. It's yeah. it's hard. Yeah. Like if you wanna do a harder job, it's arguably the hardest in the world. They say overhead rock mining, 
-hmm. and sugar cane cutting by hand. They have machines for both those jobs. Yeah. They will never have Don't, a machine to shear sheep. Well, you, you never know. I'm kidding. I don't want people to watch the video of it, but they have oh, a robot. Wait, wait, wait. There's an actual machine that shears? There's a machine that shears sheep, and I do not suggest people watch the video. I'm surprised PETA doesn't shut that robot down because I was disgusted. Really? Stretches it out, and you can tell that sheep is struggling. And then there's a human that still has to come back and shear the belly and, I believe, around the face and neck. Really? And they've put millions of dollars into this program. They try to eliminate us, but they never will. Like, yeah. we're a scourge of society. <laughs> <laughs> the dirty sheep shears yeah. will always be there. Yeah. Crawling around. Yeah, you will smell <laughs> us in Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, um, so, uh, Chase, what are some uh, pros and cons about being a sheep shearer that you've experienced? And, like, share some good memories. I mean, it sounds like you've shared lots of good memories. But oh, yeah. Like, the ones that really make make you smile at night and, yeah the and then, pros, and then, and then, and then and there may be some that make you cringe yeah the pros is just the camaraderie between the crew and like i said the familyness of it yeah. like everybody is like in lockstep as far as like you know we've blown an axle just got ripped off and not quentin yeah. this year this oh, was like yeah. on my seven man and i was going to use a come along and my buddy blows up at me and says no that won't work and i said how do you know we didn't try it yet and we sort of had a blow up freak out moment and the come along probably wouldn't have worked because it was that kind of jack he's yeah. like we got to chain it up and hook it up to pick up and jerk it into position so he walked off for like a mile and then he walked back i was like sorry you know and yeah. kind of made my amends but we we ended up getting it but the experiences are crazy that same guy this experience, I cannot believe, but he was going over Donner Pass. Where's that? It's coming out of California into Nevada. Okay. Where the Donner family had the weird eating people. Oh, and, okay. Yeah. That's why it's going a whole out. another story. <laughs> we'll hook up another channel for that. But, uh, <laughs> okay. but uh, he loses a drive line, which is very dangerous on a steep mountain pass. And it's a long mountain pass, well yeah. renowned for wrecks and whatnot. Yeah. And he loses his drive line, but it's the something with the yoke but he took a socket instead you know there's needle bearings in there he takes a socket like this is the point i'm getting to is like the engineer redneck engineering that yeah. you have to do to sometimes make it to the next job kind of like yeah. the example of the jumper cables takes a socket and black tapes it to the deal to his uh yoke to where and he made it off a of donner pass with with that like just the stories it, it's insane it, it could go on for days, yeah. but that's just kind of a fix-it story. But, like, just a good positive is, I don't know, usually end-of-the-season barbecues, and and but mid-season, all throughout the season, we'll get the farmers. They'll they'll be like, do you guys want a weather? And we'll kill a weather, hang it, mm. especially in February because it's real cold, hang it. Yeah. And, you know, you just go cut a piece of meat off and cook it up, and, and we'll do barbecues and bonfires almost every night depending on the weather and yeah. how readily available firewood is you know yep yeah but i like that like and you know just the community like i'll be the firewood guy even though you're thrashed yeah you can't shear another sheep but you can go get firewood <laughs> and maybe a couple libations kind of help with ease Libation. the pain <laughs> some liquid medicine there yeah yeah and then um what are what are some cons like of, some of the cons is just the unexpected expenses i would say like because mm. when i look back you know when i sheared sixteen thousand sheep in six months yeah i was getting paid two dollars a head but i joined the shearers union yeah. that does nothing for us <gasps> oh so i was like why don't we go on strike we get more money but it's like we're somehow shearers union is connected to something else but yeah. bernie fairchild told me if I joined the Shearer's Union, I'd get $2.10 a head. So the first thing I did was pay my $350 union dues because $0.10 cents over 16,000 sheep, yeah. $1,600. You know, that $0.10, cents, every dime counts, guys, just so you know. Yeah. It's hard work. But uh, like the unexpected things, you know, tires or like one time driving along and there's a sharp corner with no signs on this dirt road. Pony Express, stay off the Pony Express trail. <laughs> worst road I've ever been on probably in my life come around this corner and there's no signs and it's a sharp curve coming on a downhill yeah and there's a huge rock in the 
kind of like a borrow ditch or a cutout for the water drain. Yeah. Huge rock. I missed it with the pickup, but the camper was trailing behind, yeah. and it just blew both camper tires. And luckily, I had two spares. But Bernie, he would just haul butt to the next job. And so I was completely lost in the desert. Nobody waits for you on some yeah. crews, but uh, yeah. luckily I had two spares, put two spares on, go the next job or, you know, breakdowns. Yeah. And then you think, oh, cause getting paid, what I was getting back to is getting paid $2 a head, 16,000 sheep. You think, oh, $32,000 in your account. Well, you got to figure a couple thousand for fuel yeah. and tires break down, you know, and that's, that's sort of the unexpected yeah. Because everybody says when you tell them, oh, shearing sheep, 100 a day, just for easy math, three bucks a head, that's 300 bucks a day. That's, that is good money. But you also have to figure in mm -hmm. also the vehicle insurance and all that. Yeah. And yeah. then you have to also change the oil and maintain. Yeah, so. So that's, that's one of the cons. Yeah, and uh, I, don't know, I, think, I think as a beginner shear, maybe try to find a contractor that provides those things. So it's not necessarily yeah. completely on, on on the shear. So, I mean, I, the the shear contractor pay, you know, the, the contractor takes out a certain amount for a reason to cover yeah. those expenses. So, you know, especially when, when bringing in foreign shears, like they don't, you have to, so. Yeah, I have to provide yeah. that. And we have to put ads in the paper that, yeah to give Americans first dibs. Yeah. I've had zero responses to any of those. <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah. I don't know. And the other probably con would just be it's hard on your body. So yeah. you have to take care of your body as far as like getting enough sleep, which we all don't do enough. Yeah. You know, and like you need to take vitamins and-, and Train, uh, train, like train the body. Yeah. Like, like uh, well, usually when I, like during the off season, I'm always running and lifting weights and, and then so then when I make the transition back to sheep shearing, it's not as bad as. Then I drive truck in the off season, so it's really hard on me. So I yeah. get fat. Man. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one guy told me he was a horseshoer. He said, walk backwards. And I've never heard that before, but walk um, backwards for. Yeah, it helps with Like the 15 knees. minutes. Actually. Like walk backwards. And they say shears because you're standing and pacing the same yeah. pattern all day. It's good for shears just to walk, oh. like to stretch the muscle or else. You know, because I think your right foot's doing a little more stepping, yeah. and you're just well, in an awkward. Usually, in, on those long blows, I always put a little too much weight on my left foot. So at the end of the day, I'm kind of gimping because my left foot's kind of like. Yeah, and you me. look at the wear pattern on the bottom of yeah. your shoe, and yeah, it's, for me, it's the ball in the toes. Yeah, yeah. Like not so much the heel. I'm always, you know, on the toes and feet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, to kind of like wrap things up because I know we both got things yeah. to do and. And whatnot. So, uh, what what is some advice you can give to like somebody who's thinking about shearing or getting getting into it? I know you've you've already mentioned some stuff already. Okay, I would say attack and never give up. Never give up. Yeah, I like I've heard you scream that in the trailer. Never give up. Never give up. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing is the time is now. And both of them quotes came from a buddy of mine who's unfortunately in prison for some poor life choices, but he's a really good shear and a great truck driver. But he would always say, the time is now. And like, that's why they call it the present, because it's a present, you're gifted, you're alive, you're watching this video, like and subscribe to it. But uh, the time is now and never give up. Like, make your choice now because the pain and suffering you're about to go through is worth it. But don't go through the pain and the suffering for one year and then quit, because then it just doesn't make sense. Like you won't see the fulfillment of the, the satisfaction of doing it. The fruits of the labor. Yeah, the fruits of the labor. And the other thing I'd probably end on is like, I guess how shearing sheep in a spiritual way to me reminds me of, you know, a sheep will go through weeds and cactus and cockleburrs and they'll yeah. get all this junk in their wool. Oh, geez, yeah. And we remove that and give them a fresh start. Mm -hmm. So to me, and not trying to get too religious, but mm -hmm. the Lord for me, it makes me feel like I get a fresh start, but we're also providing that for the sheep, you yeah. know? Because what if next year they don't go lay down in a cactus bed or they, they're like, oh, them cockleburs sucked walking around nine months with them and we removed it. So they're like ready to like. Maybe not do that. Not do that this yeah. time, you know, so. <laughs> well, yeah, I really hope that. I think, yeah, 
well, finding a sheep without cockerbirds or cactuses isn't it? It's, it's it's always a delight. Yeah, 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 and I mean, we all get dirty and filthy, and I just feel like nice, clean white sheep. I'm yeah, we, they look like cue balls out on the green grassy yeah. hillside, and yeah. it, that's one of the best feelings. You could see the fruit of your labor, like the work you've accomplished, and yeah. I don't know. Like I said earlier, when there's nothing left in the gas tank at the end of the day, and you're just like, just thrashed. But you, it's just the feeling of being, yeah, it's 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 unexplainable. You have to kind of be there to, yep, to be to that point. Think of the hardest thing you've ever done in your life, and when you got through that, what the feeling was, mm -hmm. and that's almost <laughs> almost what it's like. Yeah. But that's every day. Yeah. But that's every day, yeah. yeah. So yeah. you get to feel that all the time. Yeah. Yep. All right, well, thank you, Chase. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you for sitting Famous, down and talking Seamus. to me. Yeah, yeah, thank you for the interview. I'm hoping that we can get more people in the industry. So if you're young and thinking about it, it's a great opportunity. And, uh, yeah, get a hold of Seamus or somebody or find a shearing school near you, and hopefully I can get to meet you here in the next few years. All right, thank you. Thank you. That's fresh. <laughs> well, that is the end of that video. And if you enjoyed it, please like it. If you enjoy my content, please subscribe for more. And also check out my Instagram, Famous James Experience. And then also check out my Facebook page. And also I do have a small store too. And uh, if, you, if you're a fan of my uh, channel, please buy a shirt or a coffee mug. I love drinking coffee. Today's my day off. So I'm gonna go edit some more videos and wash some tools. And thanks for watching the famous Shames experience. Yeah.